Hello to you. Welcome to The Reality Show. I'm Dudley Anderson, and for the next half hour or so, we're going to be sharing with you the story of life touched and changed for the good, for good, by the reality of Jesus Christ. The Reality Show shares stories of people's lives from all walks of life who've discovered the reality of Jesus. You see, the scripture says in Colossians that the ways of man we have in the world today are but a shadow. The reality, however, can only be found in a real relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Well, today we're going to be speaking about real forgiveness. And we have on the line today, John Mosey. John sadly lost his lovely daughter Helga in the 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over the town of Lockerbie in Scotland. As they watched the news unfold on the television, they were deeply shocked to the core, as you could well imagine, hundreds of people losing their lives in this dreadful event. Shock gradually gave way to sorrow. Sorrow gives way to mourning. But then mourning has the potential of giving away to anger and to bitterness. This is where God stepped in, and John and his family found the reality of forgiveness in their experience. It tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 12, that um, we shouldn't be, um, you know, encompassed by the evil of the world, but we should rather challenge the evil of the world with good. And we're going to be finding about that as we speak with John today. John, thank you so much for joining us on The Reality Show. Good to be with you. Good to be here. Thank you so much. John, what a dreadful, dreadful event in your life. Tell us, as you watched the news, tell us how that dreadful event unfolded. Yes, um, our daughter Helga was 19. She'd uh, taken a gap year before taking up her uh, place at Lancaster University. We lived in Birmingham at the time. And she'd taken a gap year and was working as a nanny in the United States. She'd been over there for a while and came home for a week before Christmas to see her friends. I was the taxi driver for a week, taking her, Dad, can you drop me off at Emma's and all this. And um, I drove her down to Heathrow on that, that afternoon and um, kissed her goodbye. I remember her coming, putting her bag down and running back across the, the room and hugging me. And um, off she went. I... I drove home, and uh, uh, a little bit later on, about um, nine, nine o'clock, there was a phone call from a lady in our church. We called her Auntie Winnie. She, she'd she had seven sons, no daughters, and Helga was the daughter that she'd always longed for. She she doted on Helga. And uh, Winnie said, oh, Pastor, did... Um, did Helga get away all right? I said, yes, thanks, Winnie. Why? She said, well, there's been a plane crash in Scotland. I said, all oh, right, OK. So um, we, I hung up and I turned on the new, on the television and uh, there was a news flash, five past nine. Um, and uh, I, I, I called my wife and our son, Marcus, who was 15 at the time, and uh, we watched as it showed pictures of the town of Lockerbie, uh, flames coming up from the, the houses. And uh, they, we thought, how awful. I remember my first thoughts were of sorrow for these people involved, because, you know, we are not involved in these things on the television. That's another, certainly the universe out there. Um, these things happen to other people, not to us. And we are observers of their sorrows. But then it came up, Pan Am Flight 103. And my wife said straight away, that's Helga's plane. It hadn't dawned on me. I checked her bags in at the Pan Am desk, but it never occurred to me. And uh, there was a, you can imagine, there was a stunned silence. Uh, the silence was broken by Marcus shouting at the screen, no, 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 no. Uh, and then my hel my wife, hel Lisa, the, the words hardly able to crawl out of her mouth, Helga, Helga, Helga. I couldn't find any words at all. And so we turned off the television. We stood in our room and put our arms around each other. And we asked God to help us. And he has done. Mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine the trauma and, and the feeling if my daughter 
uh, was on a plane that came down like it. Of course, there were many lives lost in that dreadful event. Uh, and, and the shock of it, John, you know, as you rightly said, we always think these things happen to other people, but they never happen to us. Um, there was a shock, obviously, when you got that news and you're watching it on the television of all places. Um, when and how did it actually sink in? When did you actually realize, yes, this is Helga? Well, pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, I'd worked in the aircraft industry from leaving school up to the age of, of uh, 24. And when I went to Bible school and became a minister. But uh, I, so I, I, I knew that these 747s don't just fall out of the sky. And, uh, and I guessed uh, that the, the um, deaths would be pretty total. And uh, so I, I, I was aware. I think we realized straight away. There's always a hope, of course, that maybe she survived. Um, but I, I, I think we were, we're, we're realists and we, they were telling us that uh, they found no survivors. And uh, so we, we, we took it straight away that our daughter had gone. And um, yeah, that was, wow. that was fine. Wow, must have been frightening, frightening. You know, John, I, I, as I introduced you, I said that shock gradually gives way to sorrow uh, and, and then sorrow gives way to mourning. How long did that take, you know, in, in your experience? Yes, it, um, I think the, the, the shock took, I don't know, it was several weeks, I think, really. It affected us in mm. some ways. Fortunately, uh, we had the... Uh, membership of a fi of a fine church around us, and um, we, you know that night, within within a half an hour of the news flash, we had more than forty people ring our doorbell, mm. and come and want to pray for us, and some came and we, uh, we we were blessed by their presence. Some came and just sat quietly for a few minutes and left. Some came and prayed for us. Some came and they fell apart and we had to help them. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, it was a special time in a way. Uh, and without that strengthening of the church around us and God's grace and mercy, I don't know how we'd have done. I think, you know, I was once bullied, uh, Dudley, by uh, someone, a colleague, and for, and it took me eight years to get to a place of forgiveness and to deal with it and be able to have a proper relationship with him. Mm. The, this, this thing, there was something supernatural. That's all I can say, because there was, there was the peace of God alongside this feeling of desperation. And, and it held us together. Mm -hmm. That's that's quite incredible, and as you rightly incredible, quite, yes, yeah, as as you rightly said, you know, you had the family uh, of your church standing by and helping you through that. Uh, just you know, off uh, the topic, just for a second, John, you know, it could be somebody in my church who's had a loss, be it through an illness, cancer, or whatever. Uh, how would you advise that person to comfort, or, or how would you advise me to comfort that person in my church? Oh, that's a difficult one because everyone's different. The, 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 the people you need to comfort are all different and we're all different. So we've got our own ways. But um, I think just being there, them just knowing that you're there, uh, that, um, yeah, that, that they're not on their own. Mm -hmm. Is, is an important thing. You, 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 we say oh, we, we understand, but we don't. People used to say to us sometimes, oh, you know, I, I can understand how you're feeling, but they didn't. They hadn't got a clue, really. Um, uh, we don't understand. And we don't really need to understand so much how people are feeling. It's being there, I think, that's the important thing. And the scripture tells us that he gives us the oil of joy for mourning. It's very plain in the Word of God. Uh, there comes a point in which when we go through mourning, such as you've gone through, 
Only by God's Holy Spirit can he replace that mourning and restore a joy in your heart. You know, somebody once said to me that you never overcome the death and the loss of a loved one. And I think that is true. We never overcome it. And yet only by God's grace we learn to live with it by the joy that he gives us in our spirits and in our hearts. You know, um, I did say that mourning can give way to, uh, to anger and bitterness in our lives. Did you ever find that occurred? Did you ever get angry and bitter? No, this is part of the miracle for us. There's never been any anger or bitterness. I mean, I guess that uh, there was dirty work at, uh, in, at hand here from the very beginning. As I've said, having worked in the aircraft industry, I knew that 747s, even a very old one like this, don't just fall out of the sky. They, you know, it was very good aeroplane. Uh, so there was something going on here. And as the years went by, we've discovered more and more, of course, that it, and very soon we've discovered it was a bomb that was put on the plane. But, you know, we have never had anger or bitterness. The closest we've come to anger has not been with the people who made the bomb or put it on the plane. It has been with our British and American governments, depart, government departments, who had a responsibility to protect the public and knew there was going to be a bomb on a Pan Am flight within that fortnight before Christmas. Uh, they'd even got a photograph of the thing. And they knew what to look for, where to look and when to look and did nothing about it except to warn American um, American uh, embassy staff in Europe not to fly with Pan Am. Uh, and to put pick Borta, the American, the uh, South African uh, Foreign Secretary, on a different flight. He was booked on that flight, and he was put on a different flight to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. But nobody told us. That is the thing that's brought us, brought us, I would say, the closest to anger. We've had to deal with that one. Mm, I could well in imagine that. It's inexcusable, really. Um, yep. Would they, we had more time to discuss that? Uh, but uh, just, to, just to say that uh, if anybody's just joined us, uh, you are watching The Reality Show with me, Dudley Anderson. It's really my pleasure to be with you. Uh, and today we have uh, on our, our, our show with us John Mosey, who lost his lovely daughter Helga in that 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. How drastic that must have been. I couldn't imagine how I would have felt if I'd watched a plane that has come down. So many lives lost, including the life of my young daughter. John, thank you for joining us. We're talking about your experience and, and how you dealt with it. Um, I did introduce earlier that you discovered forgiveness in all of this. How did that play out? How did you learn to forgive the perpetrator of this dreadful event? Well, this is uh, it's uncanny, as we've already said, in a way. Um, uh, we didn't really even have to try. It was just there. Um, you know, Jesus said, if we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. And as a preacher, I preached on these, these themes for over many years. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know, it, it, it was just there. In fact, we felt sorry for the people who'd had to put me, had to go to the extent of making a bomb and putting it on a plane. You know, what a miserable existence they must have. Um, and we've prayed, we've, even from the very first week, we prayed for them, that God would help them to find a better way of dealing with life. Um, so for forgiveness, uh, it's, it's, it's a very special thing. You know, one, one great writer said that, uh, that, if, that if he refused to forgive, we break the bridge over which we ourselves must walk. And I think that's so true. Mm. I need a lot of forgiving and I dare not refuse to forgive others. Absolutely. Yes, there are many people in my life that I've offended and hurt. But uh, the truth of unforgiveness is, uh, John, as you've well expressed, uh, the truth is if I hold unforgiveness against another person, be it through bullying or through a dreadful event like you've experienced, that unforgiveness will only damage me. It gets nothing back. It doesn't execute justice. It just destroys my own credibility, my own walk with God, my own happiness and joy. We just quoted uh, the scripture that says that uh, gives, God gives us the oil of joy for mourning. And if I'm holding unforgiveness, there is no space for joy in my life. Would you agree? 
Absolutely. The, if, we un, if we don't forgive, the only person that we hurt is ourselves. And um, we, we rob ourselves of that peace of God that he wants us to have in our lives. Um, of course, forgiveness um, doesn't alter the fact that the law has got to do what it's got to do. Uh, um, you know, you beat me up outside to steal my wallet. Um, I'll forgive you but I won't stop the police officer from taking you away. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he's, he, the, the law has to protect the public. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we trust, we are still hoping and praying for some justice in this matter. Well, let's speak about justice for a minute there, uh, John. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I believe that justice of God was executed once and for all upon Jesus for your sins and for my sins, for our wrongdoing, uh, for the damage that we've caused in other people's life uh, has been executed upon Jesus, that he bore that justice. You just said that, yes, indeed, under the law of the land, uh, justice needs to be executed. Uh, how do you feel about the execution of justice on this perpetrator? On this particular occasion, uh, there, there has been none. I think the... The, it, it, they said at first it was the Iranians who did it, then suddenly they changed after almost a year to Libya. Um, I think there were political uh, political reasons for all of that, which we won't go into just now. Um, uh, but uh, the, 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 the man who was convicted, who's died, the Libyan man, I'm 99% I'm certain never did it. Um, and uh, I've spoken to him while he was in prison in Scotland quite a, quite a bit, I've corresponded with him, pretty sure that he is not guilty. Uh, he was framed. But uh, we're still fighting for, for the reality, I guess. Um, but there's going to be a final judgment when the truth will come out and um, no one will get away with it. You know, uh, justice is a strange thing. But, you know, whilst we want justice, the moment we or the government or the police uh, start to want to, uh, what should I say, come at it with a revenge and vengeance, uh, then they, we become no better than the people that we're talking about. Uh, if we want our own back, uh, this was done as a, re as a revenge for other things that the West had done to people in the Middle East uh, or to countries in the Middle East. And re revenge and vengeance should never, ever come into the picture at all. It just destroys. It just destroys and, and wake, makes the situation even worse. Well, the scripture says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and he That's will right. avenge, you know, the wrong in our lives. Yes. And I thank God for that. Uh, John, we quoted a scripture earlier, if I get it right this time, it was in um, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, which says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How or what are you doing to overcome this evil with good in your life today? Yeah, yes, it's interesting that you brought that scripture into it, because on the fifth morning after it happened, uh, I, it was five o'clock in the morning and I was sitting in her bedroom, which was the attic bedroom of our house. And um, I guess I was seeking for a way of dealing with this trauma that had come into our lives. Uh, I didn't feel like that then, but I think that's what I was doing. And I found myself reading Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Um, Don't be overcome by evil, overcome evil by doing good. And I remember thinking, yes, that's how I win. That's how I win. We have got to do something to add value to our daughter's death. We have got to do something to bring some good out of this evil thing that has happened. Uh, and um, so we, we've looked at it. Uh, not long before then, I'd been appointed by uh, our group of churches, our denomination, as uh, a director for missions uh, and and for humanitarian relief in Asia. Uh, it was an unpaid and unsalaried job and I made two two trips a year out to the out to Asia 
uh, starting from Afghanistan out to the Philippines. Um, and uh, my wife went to work, worked nights in the hospital to, to pay for it all. Um, but I, I soon picked up that there were so, such tremendous needs in some of those places. One in particular in the Philippines, uh, they, they were having children abused and abandoned little children. Uh, I mean, kids, little girls under the age of three who had been sexually abused. Can you believe it? And um, uh, so we wondered, what can we do? And so we let it be known to the media and other people uh, as they came around to interview us that we wanted to build a home for these kids. Uh, checks, checks started coming through our letterbox every morning from local businesses, schools, churches, friends, friends of our daughters. And eventually we were able to build a lovely children's home in the Philippines for abused and abandoned children. There's another one in the south of India for girls from poverty-stricken families or who'd been abandoned. Um, and we've got projects in Afghanistan and other places as well. Um, and uh, so our daughter's death has produced a lot of good. I remember on the 25th anniversary of the opening of the home in the Philippines, the a lady was there who was the head of social services for all the northern part of the Philippines. And she said to me, John, she said, and well, my wife was with me, me John, he said, she said, if your daughter was still alive, more than half of these 200 plus children who have been through this home would be dead. And that made me think. And I thought, yes, I'm so glad in a way that I can't turn the clock back and have to make the decision whether to have my girl back or these hundred or more kids uh, dead. Uh, don't be overcome by evil, overcome evil by doing good. We win every time and we thank God for that and for helping us to do it. Absolutely, we win every time. Uh, John, that is incredible. Uh, just quickly for a in a, for about a minute, can you tell me, uh, how do other people respond to the work that you're doing today? I think people, uh, we get, they say nice things to us, of course, uh, uh, words of admiration, which we try not to take too much notice of, because what have we done? It's our daughters paid for it all. Um, we've done only what we feel God has wanted us to do. Uh, but... Uh, we would even use it sometimes to encourage others to look at their problems, to look at their difficulties and say, well, what can I do to bring good out of this evil? What can I do? What can we do to turn this around and so that her death or this problem has been worthwhile? And, you know, it works. So many people have come back to us and said, Yes, it works. Yes, it works. When we look at it in a positive way and say, well, OK, this is an awful thing, but uh, we've worked at it and there are good things that are happening. I remember not long before Lockerbie, I'd been reading a book called Markings by Dag Hammarskjöld, who was one of the early, for, for oh, good eight, eight years, I think, um, uh, head of the United Nations. And he uh, he said in that, and the words came to me the, the two or three nights after she was killed. It, it came to me, he says, when bad things happen to you, don't think, why has this happened? Think only, what can we do with it? And uh, I, I think he, he, had, he had hit the nail really right on the head. Mm -hmm. Thinking, what can we do with it? Uh, we've been speaking to John Mosey today on The Reality Joe. John, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you indeed. Well, we continue to pray for John and his family that they will uh, continue to do the good work that they're doing. But I'll tell you what, I was challenged by John. First of all, to learn to forgive those who hurt me and offend me. And dear God, I'm sure you put your head up very quickly. There'll be people in your life, my life, 
that have offended us and hurt us. But we need to allow vengeance for God. A uh, scripture that comes to mind in, in Psalm 37 says, Be still before the Lord, and do not fret when men succeed in their evil ways. In other words, let God be God. Perhaps you're listening up today and this has just struck a chord in your heart. Please do contact us here at Revelation or you can write to me personally by email to my personal email address dudley at surereality.net. I would love to hear from you. We just pray, Lord, that you continue to anoint uh, John in his work and his ministry as he makes a good. He turns bad situations into good situations. And help me, help my viewer today, Lord, to learn to forgive those that offend us because, Lord, in forgiveness there is forgiveness. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on The Reality Show. It's really been good to be with you. Uh, do join me again next time as we speak to a life touched and changed for the good, for good by the reality of Jesus. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>